Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and welcome if you are new here. My name is Andrea M and this is Missing Down Under. In this series, I will be covering some of the most strange, forgotten and obscure missing persons cases from the dark heart of Australia. Today, the case we will be covering happened right here in my hometown of Grafton in 1977. So before we get into today's video, I would also like to ask you if you could smash the hell out of the like button, hit subscribe hit the little bell so you don't miss any of our videos and give us a like and a comment because YouTube is noticing all of that. If you could do that, it would mean the world to me and you would be helping a somewhat brand new, new content creator get further with her career. So let's just hop right into today's story and it's a bizarre one. It's also extremely sad and there is a very big twist at the end. So let's just hop on into it. On the 21st of July, 1977, a beautiful 21-year-old girl with brown hair and hazel eyes left a note for her mother, picked up her backpack and her guitar, walked out of her parents' home in Grafton, New South Wales, and was never heard from again. Missing for over 40 years with no clues or remains ever recovered, what happened to Narelle Mary Cox? This remains a mystery to this day. Narelle Cox was a typical 1970s young lady. She had a lot of friends. She was extremely popular. She loved to travel. She also had ideations of becoming a nurse. And at the time that she went missing, she had been waiting for a telegram or papers or something to come from a hospital in Darwin. Narelle loved the beach, obviously, and that was where she wanted to train as a nurse. So back then, you need to remember this is the 70s and we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have the internet, uh, most people didn't have phones and in fact, that was one of the most upsetting parts of this case was that Narelle's mother, Beryl, did not own a phone in her home. So she could not call to find out where her daughter was, her daughter could not call her. So I think that played a big part of Narelle going missing. So at this time, she was waiting and she was waiting and she was waiting for these papers to come in the mail. They didn't come, they didn't come. It had been like three months and she was getting a little bored. She was, you know, wishing for the open road. Narelle loved to travel. She loved to go and see her friends. And she had a very good friend up in Noosa Heads called Faye. So she's decided, you know what? I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna see Faye. I'm gonna go have a great weekend. And maybe when I get back, my papers will have come in the mail. So Narelle had also had a history of hitchhiking, which back in the 70s, everybody was hitchhiking. It was kind of a freedom road kind of a deal, but it lulled everybody into a sense of security. Um, she had lived in Noosa with Faye for a little while before returning to Grafton and the girls used to hitchhike everywhere together. Uh, and they felt that it was very safe. However, it wasn't very safe. It was a very dangerous way to travel. But because it was the early 70s, late 70s, everybody was doing it and the girls felt safe. So Narelle has picked up her guitar. She's picked up a bag of clothes. She's left a note for her mother saying, going to Noosa to see Faye, I'll be back Monday. And she left and she hasn't been seen by her family since. And this is over 40 years ago. So she left the house. She made it to South Grafton. Several people did see her at the crossroads at South Grafton. And this was where it is believed Narelle accepted a ride from a long haul trucker. Uh, it was some time before he came forward, but he did tell the police that yes, he had in fact picked up a young girl matching Narelle's description and had delivered her safely to Brunswick Heads, which is about 
Probably back then it would have been three hours away from Grafton, going north on the way to Noosa. Noosa Heads is on the Sunshine Coast and it is four hours away from Grafton. In this day and age, it's four hours away. It could have been further back then because there's been a lot of improvements to the roads and the highway and the infrastructure. So back then, that was a long trip for a young girl to be making on her own. So the truck driver said that, yes, he did deliver her, that she'd gotten out of his truck, that she was safe, and he went on his way, she went on hers, and that's the last time anybody ever saw of her. So in a horrible twist of fate also, Narelle's papers from the hospital in Darwin arrived the day after she left Grafton. So she never received her nursing papers to say that she had been accepted into the program for Darwin Hospital. She never knew that her papers had come. So Narelle has left and made her way to Noosa. She never got there. So Beryl, her mother was extremely worried about Narelle. She knew she liked to hitchhike. And here is another really bad twist of fate in this story was Narelle had just turned 21 and she had just had a birthday. And yeah, she said to her mum, you know, I really don't want to party. Um, that's not for me. So she was given $200 for her 21st birthday. And back in 1977, that was a lot of money. And I think it was given to her by her mother, um, from what I've, I've read up on the case, to mitigate Narelle feeling the need to hitchhike because her mother wasn't a, a big fan of the practice. She had a really bad feeling about it. She felt that it was very unsafe and her mother was right. It was very unsafe. It came out years later when a lot of girls were going missing that there were numerous predators on the highway roaming it up and down in those days. And this is where the twist will come in at the end of this story and it's a big one. So she had been given $200 for her birthday and her mother had told her, if you want to travel, please use this to buy a bus ticket. It's probably assumed that Narelle did not use this money to buy herself a bus ticket because she did hitchhike. It's actually not known what she did with it, if she had it on her when she left, if she had in fact bought a ticket maybe for the rest of the way and then decided not to use it. That's another question we'll never know. So Monday morning came, Narelle failed to return home and Beryl was worried immediately. She just had that mother's intuition. She had that bad feeling that something was wrong. So in those days, if you wanted to message somebody urgently, there was no texts, there was no messenger, there was no emails. There was no way to just get an urgent message to somebody unless you had a telephone and Beryl's family did not have one. So Beryl went down to the post office and in those days, the only way you could overnight a message was to send a telegram. So Beryl has sent an urgent telegram to Faye. Um, Narelle told us that she was coming to see you for the weekend. She hasn't come home. She was supposed to be home today what's going on. And the next day, Faye, also worried, telegrammed Beryl right back saying, I have not seen or heard from Narelle. So this has put um, Narelle's mother straight into a panic. She has rushed to the local police station with um, Narelle's sister, Karen, and she was met with reticence from the local police. They didn't think it was serious. She'd only been missing for probably a few hours from when she was supposed to arrive home. And the police said she's a 21 year old woman. She has the right to leave and go wherever she wants. I'm sure she'll turn up. I'm sure it'll be fine. But Beryl knew that something was wrong. It was out of character for Narelle not to get in touch with her. You know, she would have sent a telegram. She would have found a way to let her mother know, you know what, I'm having a really great time up here with Faye. I'm gonna stay a bit longer. That didn't happen. Faye had not seen her. She had not turned up. So Narelle's mother tried to report her as a missing person at Grafton Police Station. Back then, the, the police 
didn't have the forensics, they didn't have the know-how, they didn't have the same kind of missing persons unit that they have today. And they said, look, just wait, I'm sure she'll be fine, she'll come back. However, Narelle never returned home. After several visits to the police station with no news, Beryl and Narelle's sister Karen got into their car and they drove all the way to Brisbane. They stopped into every locale on the way, every nook and cranny, every small town, hoping to find out if somebody had seen Narelle. Every town they went to, they showed her picture. They asked people, have you seen my daughter? Have you seen my sister? Nobody had seen Narelle. So they drove all the way to Brisbane and attended Brisbane Police Station. And when they arrived to the desk and they spoke to the sergeant on duty, they were hit with the most shocking and heartbreaking news that a mother could ever get, apart from finding out that yes, your child has been found deceased, that Grafton Police Station had not alerted Brisbane. They did not tell them that there was a local girl from Grafton missing, that she may be in your area to be on the lookout for her. Nothing had been done. So after that, it was at least six weeks since Narelle had gone missing at this stage and Beryl and Karen got back in their car and drove back to Grafton, absolutely broken hearted and still no word from Narelle. So it was after this revelation that the Daily Examiner finally ran an article on Narelle and with the original information that the family had given the police, the article read that the police were anxious to get in touch with a Miss Narelle Cox, 21, who had thought to have gone missing on the 21st of July. And it was not long after this that a local fisherman actually came forward. And this was another horrible twist in the story that gave the family false hope. And he was fishing a little further downstream at Lawrence from Grafton. And he said that he had actually pulled up the body of a young woman on his anchor when he was finishing his day of fishing. What happened next is allegedly the fisherman took fright and dropped the anchor, therefore releasing the body. And when he heard that Narelle was missing, he went to the police station and he said, you know, I think I may have pulled up a girl's body the other day on my boat. It was very, very quick. I'm not sure what I saw. I dropped my anchor. I was in shock. So then the police divers were called in. The police dragged the river. No body of a young woman was ever found. And the description that he gave the police of the brief glimpse of what he thought was a body that he pulled up in his anchor did not match Narelle. He said he thought he saw long blonde hair and the clothes that he described as the body wearing did not match anything that Narelle owned. Nobody else had been reported missing at this time. So that also remains a mystery as to who this young girl may have been that had been pulled up on this anchor. Uh, the fisherman was also under suspicion um, in the local area. He did have a reputation of not being the most reliable character. So there they were met with false hope and yet another dead end. So it wasn't long after this that the truck driver who actually picked Narelle up came forward and he said, yeah, you know, I did pick up a young girl that matches that description. However, I have a family. I don't want to be embroiled in this. Please don't give them my name. But yes, I did see her and I dropped her off at Brunswick Heads. So during the time that they were looking for Narelle and that there was finally some media involvement, no matter how small and cursory it was, nobody had seen Narelle. Uh, updates started to come in sporadically. Um, it was mainly people saying that yes, they had seen her at South Grafton and she did indeed have a backpack on her back. She had her guitar with her and somebody actually did see her climbing into the truck. However, after that, the trail goes cold. Another year passes, the family still have no word and then there comes a knock at the door one day. And this was probably the cruelest thing that happened in this case. Um, and it's believed that um, Narelle's mother was never the same after this. And a policeman came to the door, he knocked on the door and he said, oh, you know what, we've found your daughter. She's alive and well, she's in Sydney. 
and like Beryl was overjoyed. She was like, well, where is she? How can I find her? Where did you hear this from? So then it was a trip to Sydney and Narelle had actually applied for the doll in Sydney. She had um, gone to, I think it was, it's what we call our Centrelink back then. I think it, now, I think back then it was called Human Services, something like that. In a very cruel twist of fate, again, this was an application that Narelle had made a year to 18 months earlier when she was briefly living in Sydney and looking for work. So it was another dead end. It was another seed of false hope for the family. And it is thought by the three remaining siblings that this pretty much cost their mother her life. Beryl actually passed away in 1983 and her husband, Bill, passed away in 1994. They never found out what happened to their daughter. They went to their graves with many unanswered questions. So after the passing of Narelle's parents, it was then up to her siblings to find out what happened to her. So Narelle was survived by three younger siblings, two sisters and a brother. And it was now up to them to keep the search for their sister alive and see if any new leads would come up in the case. So many years went by and this is where the big twist in the case comes. In 1994, the police launched an investigation called Task Force Air. Those of you who are familiar with this case will know exactly what I'm talking about. Task Force Air was the investigation into the backpack killings that had happened. We probably estimate they started back in the early 1970s, early 1960s. And who was at the center of the backpacker killings but our worst and most notorious serial killer to date, Ivan Milat. It was while Karen was watching the reports from Task Force Air on the news that she started to have a very familiar feeling that Ivan Milat may have been responsible for her sister's disappearance. She contacted Task Force Air, not expecting a reply, but they did reply back to her. And what the detectives had told her at the time was, you know, you know look, it's really, really slim chance that it was Malat that took his sister. He was signed into work at that time. It's probably not him. But as we found out, as Task Force Air went on and they dug more and more and more into Ivan Malat and his modus operandi and the things that he used to do is he would do that. He would sign into work and then he would leave and he would go around the roads looking for young people to abduct. And at this time, in another very stunning twist of fate, Ivan Malat was in the Northern Rivers area and he was working on a road crew around Brunswick Heads. So if Narelle did indeed disembark the truck at Brunswick Heads, it would have put her directly in the path of Ivan Malat. Ivan Malat died in 2019 and he took a lot of secrets to his grave with him. So there was still no closure for this family. Her body still has never been found, but her family believes that Ivan Malat may have been responsible for Narelle going missing and that he may have murdered her. Um, at that particular time, he had also served some time here in Grafton in the jail and he knew the area very, very well. He knew the rivers very, very well. And this was before he started his killing campaign in Belangolo State Forest and that was where Task Force Air began. He was living in Belangolo State Forest in the 80s and 90s and that was where he was burying his victims. That was where a lot of young backpackers went missing. But we're not going to talk about them today. Today is about Narelle Cox, a Grafton girl who had a promising future ahead of her. She was well liked. She was going to become a nurse. She was going to help people and she never got the chance. So... The investigations went on, 
I'm not sure if they ever questioned Malat about Narell. Uh, it's not made clear in the, the transcripts from missing persons that I've used for this case. Um, but apparently, as Karen found out at that particular time, Ivan Malat was not, in fact, the only predator roaming the roads back then. There was a veritable smorgasbord of predators that the police didn't know anything about. And in 1977, nobody knew who Ivan Malat was. He had already started his killing campaign. He was already one of our worst serial killers. However, nobody knew who he was. So that was why nobody knew to question him or to look at him when Narelle went missing. So it went on and on and the case went cold and it wasn't until that the coroner asked for DNA um, to try and match unsolved cases, missing people, bodies that had been unclaimed to Narelle. So the DNA was obtained from her sister Karen and her brother Bill and the coroner ended up ruling the case closed because no further evidence came to light. So the case was closed in 2005 without any further investigations. So Narelle is now survived by Karen, her younger brother Bill and her younger sister Kathy. And Kathy found herself always looking as she was driving the highways at every hitchhiker she passed to see if any of them were in fact her missing sister. To this day, nobody knows what happened to Narelle Cox. She disappeared without a trace. She was a local girl and I'm sure she was very well loved and her family are still grieving for her. Her parents never found out what happened to her and I, I find this case really sad in that way as it could have been anybody walking around minding their own business just wanting to travel about who was taken and never seen or heard from again so that being said if anybody remembers anything if you're from grafton if you did happen to be around back then and you saw norell if there's any little thing you can remember just a call to your local police station would be of a big help to the family i'm sure and that's going to do it for today's story I hope you found today's case interesting and intriguing. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more videos just like this one. I will be covering another spooky, obscure cold case next week. And until then, that's going to do it for today. Stay safe, everybody. Please don't hitchhike. Still, just don't do it at all. Get a lift from a friend. Buy yourself a ticket. Ask a family member to drive you. The roads are still not a safe place for anybody. There's still a lot of bad people around. So please stay safe out there, especially over the Christmas period. And I will see you all back here soon. Bye.